Oh, hello, everybody. <coughs> I think this means I'm live. Nice to see you. Hello, everybody. Let's turn that sound off on my monitor. Otherwise, you'll hear me say everything twice. Could do without that. Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, or whatever time of day it is where you are. Welcome to the live stream. So today, I'm painting a rose, a single rose. Not one of these. These are for something else. Exceedingly beautiful, but they're not what I'm going to be painting today. Um, I'm going to be painting, you can hopefully see it, this. It's not actually that big, that's a photo. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've started referring to a lot lately as the colour story. Now, let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. If you take something very simple, a simple object, let's say this squash is pretty simple, okay? Because it has, it's one local color all the way across. The color doesn't really change. Uh, the local color is the color this thing is independent of light or shadow, okay? So if you were going to mix a color and put a dab of it on here and have it basically disappear, then that would be the local color that you've mixed. But this color changes as it goes from light to shadow. So because I've got so much light in this room, basically for streaming, you don't really, you can't really see a lot of shadow. But if you imagine that half of this squash was in shadow or a third of it was in shadow, then the color story is what happens to the local color as it comes into the light, when you get light from the window outside coming onto it, and as it travels through, it goes into the shadow. Now we know the value drops, but I think the really interesting things that, and also the things that people often get wrong is, um, yes, the values, but also how the chroma changes and how the hue changes. And that is the, is the color story of this local. Now, what's interesting about this rose and part of what makes um, painting roses so tricky is that the local color changes across the surface of the rose. And it's not like there's one bit is one color and one bit is another color. It changes gradually. So towards the middle of this rose, the local color is more orange red. And as you get to the outside, the petals become more of a blue red, a purple red. So that becomes part of the color story. So if you want to paint this rose well, it's probably going to help you if you can control the light and the shadow colors across not just the two extremes of the, the changes of that local color, not just the purple and the more red, the more orange red, but all the way in between as well. It's partly why it's a little bit tricky. And there's another thing that makes them even more tricky, which I'll talk about in a minute, and I can't wait to paint, is... Um, <clears throat> Flowers especially, I mean, they, they are, the petals are often very thin, very diaphanous, and the light travels through them. And what happens when the light travels through a petal is it becomes, it's like it traveling through a gel, you know, on a light. It picks up some of the color of the petal. Okay. Sorry, let me just check everything's working all right. Yeah, it looks like we're all good. So the light travels through the petal and it picks up. If you imagine that this is a petal, the light comes through the petal and it picks up. When it comes out the other side, it's picked up some of the, the color of the petal. Not only that, it hits a petal of another color, probably a very close color, on the other side, and then it bounces back on itself. And then it hits this petal again and bounces back. So what tends to happen within that area, if there's a fold, in the rows inside here the light comes through here it travels into here the chroma goes up quite a lot because the light has an intrinsic color to it um, also the value will often be a little bit higher than you would think for a shadow because the light is traveling through this petal out here okay i'm going to talk a little bit when i show you the palette about how that actually happens you know what let me switch over to um to the palette.
just going to be a second. Send a little message into the chat and make sure that's working. There we go. Looks like it's all good now. Hello, Del. Good to see you. I think it's the first time you've been to one of these, and we were just chatting by email this morning, weren't we? Um, hello, Lisa. Logan, good to see you too. I hope your lights are being are sorting themselves out okay. So you can't see anything at the moment, can you? I've like I've wandered off. I'm behind the flower. Okay. I'm actually an elf and I'm hiding behind the flower. Let me switch over. There we go. So now you can see um, <clears throat> the reference photo. Let me knock this big light off. You can see the reference photo. Um, you can see the palette and I've already got some colors mixed on there. And you can see I've already started on the painting, right? Let me, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But first, let me bring the exposure of that camera up because it's a bit dark. That's better. That's probably about how it appears to me in the studio. So this has been done. This is dry. So I already did this like sometime last week. <clears throat> I'm actually meant to do this stream last week sometime, but you know, life got in the way, <laughs> was busy with stuff. Um, so this has been done using the wipeout method. So I covered this, this is a panel. It's actually an oil primed linen panel and I covered it with a middle value, this value here. And then I wiped out the lights and then I painted in the darks. And the values are actually pretty close to what they need to be. You know, let me show you the palette. I'll show you the palette full screen. I'm just going to knock the, the reference photo off for a second. Hello, Laurie. Hello, Marianne. You're very welcome, Doe. Linda, good to see you. And Renee's here as well. Nice to see you. And Desiree, good to see you too. Good morning. Um, I'm going to take the photo off just for a little bit, get that out of the way so you can see all of the palette. So you can see I've got some Monzo chips over here, but um, <clears throat> I've got most of the colors that I need mixed anyway, enough to start on it, but I'm going to show you like how I arrived at some of these colors and why, although this at first sight, this may look like, like just a random kind of series of dabs of color, there is actually some logic to it. So hopefully it should be reasonably obvious that everything on this palette is organized from light at the top and dark at the bottom. So the values go up from the bottom to the top. Okay. Same, I tend to set out my paints that way too. Um, <clears throat> but I've also got them roughly divided into two. So you know, if you think of that as the division between the two sets of colors here. On this side, on the left side, these are the colors on the outside of the rows, and they are more blue-red. These are the colors on the inside of the rows, and they are more orange-red. But on top of that, what tends to happen, in reds anyway, I'll just talk about the reds today because this is the rows. Well, let's say the local color on the outside is about that hue. You know, it's it's a bluish red. It's somewhere between this red and that red, right? As we go down the value scale into the shadow, the hue goes a little bit round towards orange. Now these colors, which are for the middle of the rows, they're already quite a, a bit, little bit more orange anyway. It's more an orange red over here, you know, in terms of the hue. So as we go down from light into shadow in the middle of the rows, we go even further round more orange. And you'll find that a lot. Is It's the old thing that people talk about, cool lights and warm shadows. It's only relevant for indoor light. Um, and it does happen to varying degrees. <clears throat> but what, mostly what you're seeing is a change in um, value and uh, chroma, but you also see a little bit of a change in hue as well. Let's go back up to the main 
Did that work? Yeah, good. So this is all neutrals at the moment. Hello, Father. Good to see you. Kelly, nice to see you too. And Greg, good to see you. Lots of friends popping up today. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do before I do anything else actually is I'm going to put a layer of medium on this. So this is um, linseed oil. I'll put a little bit of solvent in with it. I'm generally not too bothered about this being like perfect um, recipe or anything. But the reason the solvent is in there is to help the oil take. Sometimes the oil, if, if you use just oil, it will bead up a little bit on the surface. A good way around it is to use something like oleo gel if you just want to use oil and no solvent. Or you can cut it with a bit of solvent which help, helps it cover. So this is a makeup sponge. My wife need not know. Um, <clears throat> wipe it back so there's not too much on there. So yeah, this is really nice panel actually. It's a, it's a fine linen panel that I primed quite a long time ago with lead oil primer and it gives you a really nice um, smoothest sur surface to paint on. So looking at these colors, um, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna put them on and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about why they're there and how I mixed them as well. Let's do it that way around. Should we do it that way around? Would kind of make sense. So we'll try and do like simplified colors first so I can talk about the general color story. So right in the middle of the rose is where we have our most orange. I could say warmest, but let's say most orange colors right in here and that's because the center of the rose the local of the center of the rose is more orange anyway than the blue red on the outside and it's in shadow which sends it even more orange so here i've got oh this is rosemary's angled eclipse synthetic i really like the synthetics from rosemary's i think the hogs are absolutely awful but the, <laughs> seriously but the synthetics are lovely so um, I'm right down the bottom of the value range. Hopefully you can see that here, right? So this is, a, I could probably go even more orange than that. Put a little bit of transparent red oxide in there and pop some of this in. This is like right in the middle of the rows. Bang, I mean, immediately we've got some chroma in there. I'm probably gonna go a little bit lower value than this in some parts. So I'm mostly trying to get the general shape, you know, but using um, hopefully the right colors, you know, or at least colors that make sense within this color story to get there. Looks very orange at the moment, but don't forget that we're seeing it in relationship to everything else which is here. Probably take that out here. The nice thing about working like this as well is that if I decide I, that I've made a mistake, like, oh dear, I didn't want that dark value there. I can wipe it back. Get rid of it. So you have a lot of really fine control over the paint this way, which is really nice. Hello, Ina, good to see you. Arkansas, you know, every time I see that, I want to say Arkansas. I'm sorry, I'm an ignorant Brit. <clears throat> but it's Arkansas, right? Logan says, I, I, I knew I was colorblind, but I see, it, I see brick red. It is brick red. It's a, dark, it's a dark orange. I mean, you can call it brick red, but it's better thought of as a dark high chroma orange. I mean, that's what brick red is. Don't forget, a lot depends on your screen as well, you know. So actually, let me tell you, I'm going to go back to the palette now, and I'm going to show you why that's there and how I mixed it. 
I'm going to leave the reference photo on because it's going to be a mess about if I keep taking it on and off. And I'll, sooner or later, I'll just forget to bring it back up. Okay, so we're right in the center of the rows. Okay, so these are the center rose colors over on the right. Phew. <laughs> Hello, Sharon. Good to see you. Thank you. That's nice to hear. Um, <clears throat> So down in shadow, we've got our most, we've got, we're right down the bottom of the value range. Darker probably than you might think. I mean, this is like almost as far down as you can go in, in value terms. Um, <clears throat> it's like a, almost a value one. It's almost the same value as the black here, right? So let me tell you what I've got. This is titanium white, which I'm probably not going to use. This is lead white, which I will use. This is cadmium yellow. Why cadmium yellow? Because a lot of these reds tend towards orange, um, especially high up in the range. They tend towards orange as well in the lights towards the middle of the rows. Rows, so I need to be able to pull something towards or towards yellow orange. Um, yellow ochre. That's probably a security blanket that I won't use. It's just there because yellow ochre is a useful color, but I probably wouldn't use it for these mixes. This one is permanent orange. I'll talk about that one in a little bit. This is quinacridone rose. And this is here because it is a very flexible and useful red. So if I put quinacridone rose with cad yellow, I can actually get some pretty intense oranges, some very intense oranges. So why have the permanent orange there? I'll tell you in a minute. I've used up all of my uh, quinacridone rose, and I'm going to have to put a little bit more. I mean, quinacridone rose is basically a very powerful, trans semi-transparent blue-red. Very, very useful colour. Underneath the quinacridone rose, I've got transparent red oxide. The clue is in the name that's also transparent, but it's very orange. So that means that with these two, the quinacridone rose and the transparent red oxide, I can get either more towards a blue red or more towards an orange red, towards the bottom of the scale. This is um, raw umber, which is mostly there in order to help create neutrals. And this is ivory black. So let's say I wanted to create the lowest possible value red orange that I, uh, that I could, like um, <clears throat> Transparent red oxide is brilliant for this. It's very low value. It's about the highest chroma you're going to get right down there in that hue range. If I wanted it to go even darker, put some black in it. Now I'm going to lose chroma. For sure I'm going to lose chroma if I do this. It's almost complement mixing because the ivory black is actually a blue. So I will lose chroma, <coughs> but I will get the value right down. You know, and the chroma is difficult to judge at such a low value anyway. So that's got me right down the bottom of the value range. And I could put some quinacridone rose in it. It will raise the value a little bit, but it will also send it more towards blue red. And it will also bring the chroma back. It is still an orange, generally speaking. And that's pretty much how I mix this color here. This next one up here, slightly going up the value scale. So if, if you don't, if anybody's watching, they haven't done a course or a workshop with me and don't intend to, just get one of these. It's a Paul Cantore Munsell value scale and it's incredibly useful because you can put dabs of paint on it. So let's say, so this one, I can check the value of this. So this is the value range of paint, right? From very low value to very high. So I can check the value of that. That's right down the bottom. This next mix is and kind of the next step up, next couple of steps up. So it's like a value three, which is about here. So this transparent red oxide is actually slightly darker than that. So what if I wanted to lighten this and I wanted as much chroma as I possibly could? What's chroma? It's this. This is value from light to dark. This is chroma from near gray to more intense color. You could think of it as, you know, more colorful. 
if I bring some, I only want to use high chroma colors, right? So I can bring in a little bit of cad yellow and that'll get me, I'm still at the maximum chroma I can get down here, but it's going to send it very, very orange. So I could bring in a little bit of the quinacridone rose, which would also pull it back towards red a little bit. And here's your brick red, Logan. So this is pretty much the highest chroma I can get in these red oranges that I want right down the bottom of the value scale. And so far I've only used this one. What if I picked up my very darkest one? Now, this is really, really dark, just for the real dark parts of this rose. Like just a few little notes right in the deep part. It's getting such a visual depth to it now. I've hardly painted anything. You know, very little colour so far. Treasure says, what colour does yellow ochre swing towards? It doesn't swing towards anything. I mean, I, I wouldn't think of a colour as swinging towards anything. I mean, I know people talk about undertones and which way they, they, they swing or which way they trend. You know, I like to know what a colour is. And in terms of its hue, it's just a red, or it's, it's a, an orange. It's a red orange, basically. Sorry, a yellow orange, yellow ochre. It's an orange, but it's slightly lower chroma. You know, these two colors here are pretty much the same value. Um, in terms of the hue, they're not that different. This one is more towards yellow and this one is more towards red, but they're both oranges. But this one is quite low chroma and this one is off the scale, permanent orange. It even looks lurid sitting on the palette. It looks like too much. Okay, so this is like, that's my darkest color in the middle of the rose where it goes the most orange, right? So the story there of the local is going from light to shadow. So these colors here, actually in terms of the hue, they go slightly more, just a little bit back towards red you know, because we get our warmest colors in the shadows down here, we get our warmest hues in the shadows. So the, the hue is going slightly cooler here. And the chroma is also dropping. So we've got our highest chroma down here and the chroma has gone up a little bit here. So let's say I want to put a little bit of those. I'm going to choose a smaller brush. It's the same type though, another angled eclipse. Borna says, are you making colors by yourself or are they from the tube? Oh, they're all mixed. So these are the tube colors over this side and these are the ones that I've mixed from the tube colors. So let's put in like a little bit of the lightest, very lightest part. So this is almost the highest value we can possibly get. It's, this is like in our value scale, right? This is a value nine, it's a way up here. So where's the lightest part of the middle of the rose? There are a couple of bits on the inside of the rose where it's really, really light. There's this bit here. So I'm just looking for bits that really, really stand out when I squint down. And there's a light bit here. And this is interesting here because we've got a light shape against a dark shape. So there's a, that's gonna draw your eye. And there's also just a tiny little bit of very light back here. So these, so I don't want to be getting out here because by the time I get out here, it's gone into red purple. So I've got to be careful with that. But here we're still a little bit more orange red. While we're at it, let me show you something. I'll show you, I'm going to go to the palette again, just quickly and show you why that um, permanent orange is there. So let's say I want to mix a really high value red, any of these reds, right? So if I get quinacridone rose and I add it to white, this is lead white, remember? It's really, really blue red, a really blue red. 
you know, the value is right. I mean, that might be useful for right, like the very outside petals of the rose, so I can stick it over there. Oop, I almost put Quinacodone rose in my white pile. That would complicate matters somewhat. It's too blue, especially for the middle of the rose, you know. Well, what I could do then, let's say I could get some white and I could start off with some Quinacodone rose. Remember, I'm still right up the top of the value scale here. And if that's a bit too blue, well, what can I do? I can add a little bit of yellow. I can't add too much because the yellow is a lower value as well than the white. It's still looking kind of blue. I'm going to have to add a little bit more yellow if I want it to get round. So all I'm trying to do is move this very high value red round towards orange a little way. And that's not bad, and you could probably paint with it, and it would be all right. But what if I wanted the, the highest chroma I could possibly get, the most intense color I could possibly get at that value? The way to do that is with the permanent orange, just a tiny bit in there. And it's way higher chroma than the yellow, and much higher than the quinacridone rose. So just a little bit of that in there. Oh, look, I am going to have to take that. Sorry, Marianne. Marianne's saying the photo is blocking the mixture. I've just realized that. It's so annoying. There we go. So this was the first one that I did. And this is the second one. So I can bring that value down even a little bit further. Now, I know it's difficult to see on a screen, and a lot will depend on how good your screen is, seeing these differences. And you could argue that it doesn't make that much difference in a painting. I'd be inclined to disagree, though. So of the two of them, they're both about the hue I want. They're both the value I want. But this one is much more intense. Noticeably higher chroma. And that's how I got this color up here. And that's what the permanent orange is there for. It's just there to help me get the highest chroma I possibly can. in the hue that I want, right at the top of the value scale. That's what it's there for. Did that make sense? So I don't choose colors based on any abstract um, kind of idea of a palette, like a split primary or a CMYK or anything like that. I choose them based on the color that I want. I start with the color that I want, and then I find out which colors are going to get me there. You know, and that gave us these colors here, the really light ones. So let's say I'm going to move right immediately, right? I'm going to change the, the part of the story that we're in. I'm going to go to this chapter out here, right on the outside. Yeah, these are all Michael Harding. I, I, uh, I think all of these are, except for the white, which is Rublev. I really like Rublev lead white. Very, very nice. So the light part, like right out in the purple, purple reds. <clears throat> there isn't actually that much of it. There's a bit out here. There's a, there's a, there's a petal here in the light. There's a couple of tiny little edges of petals there that are the same color, but I'm not going to bother with those too much. There's a little bit here. So we're on the outside of the rose, so we're, we're more of them towards the purple red. And on its own, it doesn't stand out as being that different. Notice how the value has come up on those parts, though. You will also see local changes there as well, but we kind of ignore those for the moment. They're, they're best dealt with separately. What I mean by that is there's a bit of this petal where it's actually get, kind of getting old and looking ready to drop and it goes a bit more yellow. So 
you know, the thing is about, about colour, I think, there are ways now that you can get extremely, extremely close to the exact colours that you see in a photo. But I think it's, and that's a useful thing, you know, because it will help you to get colours more right. It will, it will tell you things about colour. But I think it's much more useful to understand why colours are the way they are, how they change from light to shadow, the general principles of colour across form especially with flowers, and then you'll find that you will be able to make better guesses, even if you're not using something like Munsell chips to help you nail it. So this is like a shadow, this area here is quite interesting because it's a shadow area, but it's the outside of the rose. Another thing about this area is um, there is no light traveling through the petals into this part of the rose. That is a tiny bit, maybe, but very little. This is like almost all shadow. So it's the outside of the rose, so it's like a, it's the purple blue part, but it's going a little bit more red, a little bit, but not much. And it's quite low chroma because it hasn't got this extra light traveling into it. It's actually something like about this color here. And I've got a lighter version of it here, so I can bring up the value in a couple of places if I want to, because it's not all quite that dark. So I just want to try and get this in about the right shape. Obviously, I'm going to go into these colors in a lot more detail. The mixing of them and how you make them in the workshop, but this should be enough to give you a good idea of the kind of, the general sort of thrust of what this workshop is going to cover. You'll notice over here we go into a, a deep shadow and, and we're back, this part here, this is an exterior petal. Here we're back on the inside of the rose, we're deep inside the petal there, so what happens to the colour? Goes back towards our more orange. Why does it do that there? It's because we're on the inside of the rose again. That's deep inside the rose, and this is the outside of the rose. And it's seeing these changes and understanding why they're there basically demystifies <clears throat> the colors of something like this. Nina says, what type of rose is your example? This is a David Austin rose. I'm, um, I don't know the variety, actually. Not sure. Oh, hang on, let me, um, let me catch up with her. Couple of questions. Frenti says, what other colors are on your palette today? I've been through it, but I'll go through it again just quickly. I've got um, titanium white, which I'm probably not gonna use. I've got lead white, cad yellow, yellow ochre, probably not gonna use that, permanent orange, quinacridone rose, transparent red oxide, raw umber and black. So they're all kind of yellows and oranges and, and, and blue reds. So I can get close to this, the colors of the flower. Hello, Lisa. I'm glad you're here. Joanne says, can you explain high chroma? I thought it was hue without white or black. No, 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 no. White and black will generally drop chroma if you mix it in. But what chroma is, is this. Let me put it there so it's easier to see. So this is very close to gray. So this is value, right? From light to dark. This is very low chroma, close to gray. And then it gets more and more and more intense until it gets to a much more intense color here. Now, <clears throat> these are all the same value, and they're all the same hue. I'm going to do some playing in a second on the palette that will show you what chroma is on the palette and how, or one way anyway, at least, that you can control it. Obviously, I've got a lot of these colors ready anyway. This area is really interesting over here, because this is the bit that I was talking about where you've got light traveling through the petal. So this part here, 
I mean, this should really be shadow, right? Ordinarily, if this rose was solid, that would be shadow because the light is coming from the left. But because it's diaphanous, people often say, how do you get those? How do you make petals look? Like that see-through kind of diaphanous quality. And it's basically the color, and getting the right colors and values. So this is going to be a little bit higher chroma. We're still on our, over towards our slightly more blue reds because we're over this part of the, of the palette. And then as it goes down into the shadow, this is one of those areas that I was talking about where the chroma actually comes up a lot. It goes down the value range a little bit, but not a huge amount. And you get a lot more chroma because the light is traveling. This is shadow I'm painting here, but it's higher chroma and it's lighter than these shadows over here because the light is traveling through the petal. It's picking up the color of the petal and then it's bouncing inside, bouncing off another petal. So you get that kind of high chroma area in the shadows. starts to look like um, makes the petals look soft and, and more diaphanous and like the light is coming through them. And on the very outside here, the light isn't traveling through the petal, it's hitting its side on. So that's actually a bit, it's lower, lower uh, chroma out here and lower value. And then I'll mix between them so I can control the values. It's definitely not the only way of painting a rose, you know, of approaching the color of a rose, but it really, really helps. It really helps. I mean, you can, you can work extremely hard for years and, and figure out a method that will work for you a kind of a, quite a, I would say, a, almost a personal, a very personal method. And that's fine and it does work. But thinking about things a little bit more clearly, especially in terms of view, how, uh, hue, value and chroma will help you get there much more quickly. So cooler reds on an otherwise warm color palette. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Lisa says, Paul, is it the angle of the brush that helps avoid the petal look? By that, I mean not letting it look like painting petals. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say I call it the way I use these brushes. I call it. Um, the calligraphy of the brush. It's like everybody has their own calligraphy. Everybody puts their own kind of marks down in their own way. Um, and I personally think it's it's a skill that's worth developing in and of itself. So, I mean, for me, I, I decided that this was something that I wanted to learn. So I, um, I spent some time um, painting with a Chinese brush and ink doing a lot of line drawings, you know, like a little bit like uh, Subi Japanese painting, a little bit like that, but more like kind of, I suppose you would call it kind of Gongbi painting. I need a little bit more chroma here, I think. And uh, learned to draw with the brush basically, and, that, and then that, it comes out in, in lots of different ways. So I'm gradually moving, I'm at the inside of the rose here, so I'm moving from shadow up to light. So I'm mixing between these colors to get the colors that I want to slowly move me up into the light. I'm not actually painting any forms at the moment. 
apart from trying to keep an, an idea of the overall form, which I've already worked in the in the in the first kind of session on this. You know, what? I really want to see how these colours are working against some background and some green now. Um, well, I was going to talk about, yeah, before I do that, actually, let me talk about what's happening up here with the chroma. Because ordinarily speaking, this is one of the things that makes roses tricky. You know, this is really, really subtle what's going on here in terms of the colour. And it takes, it takes some understanding of the way the colour works. Uh, and frankly, a, a lot of care to get something like that right. So let me talk a little bit about, it's hard to talk about it with, um, without having the painting up at the same time, but let me show you first a way of controlling chroma, which I want to take you through. I'll try and use this part of the palette <laughs> so you can see what I'm doing, right? Prentice says, how is the portrait practice going? It isn't, it isn't actually. I've dived back into roses again. I'm in love with roses again at the moment. I will get back to it at some point. Um, but ah, so many beautiful things to paint and not enough time. Um, let me talk a little bit about what happened in that area. So it's, I'm o it's over the left part of the rose, right? On the outside. The petal is, imagine the light is coming from there, from the left. So the light is coming in like this, right? And imagine that this is a petal. The light comes in and it goes through the petal. But some of the petal is bending back towards the light like this. And what happens, you can even see it happening on this. Just a bit of kitchen row. So here, this part here, the light is traveling through it and it gets this kind of glow. Here. It's almost at the same angle as the light rays coming in here. So what happens is the chroma drops and the value goes down a little bit. So <clears throat> this, is, this is pretty much the color here that I'm using for the lighter parts of that petal. Where the light is traveling through it, it should be shadow, it should be dark, but the light is traveling through it. So it gets lighter and it gets higher chroma. Okay, so these are all the same value. Right. These are all on the value scale. These are all a uh, seven. So if I put that on my value seven blob, there, and I put this on there, they're both the same value, right? This one stands out more because the chroma is higher. But if you um, if you have a value scale like this. How can I do this? I'm just going to move that paint out the way for a second so I can show you something. If you have this value scale, I don't know how well this will come across actually, but let's try it and see. If I've got my phone, a really handy way, because especially higher chroma colors can be very difficult to judge. If I put, if I go into my photos app and I hold that over that part of the, the value scale, right? I'll try and zoom it in so you can see it a little bit better. And I go into the color editing and I move it right over until I've removed all of the color information. I'm only left with value. You can actually see that at one of my, the neutral is bang on, but the, the other color is slightly lighter. So my value is slightly out, but that's a really good way to check value. You can just see it there standing out a little bit. The value is a little bit too high. A really handy way to check if you're getting your values right. So we're going to be doing that in the workshop. Like it's, there's no requirement to have a Munsell book, but everybody who's doing the workshop has to have. In fact, anybody who learns with me from now on or from, from a few months ago, a few workshops ago on has to have one of these because you can nail the values with this thing. And value is the most important part of painting. Let's put these colors back where they belong. Which is also why I lay my palette out like this. And I, I do this just when I'm painting as well, not only when I'm teaching, you know. So I've got um, 
higher chroma value 7 here, right? So how did I mix that? Well, if I start off with the cronacridone rose, that's too dark, right? Let's mix some white in with it to bring it up to a value 7. Why am I starting with the quinacridone rose? Because it's, it's a blue-red. And I'm on the outside of the flower, so I probably want to be over that way a little bit. Is that about a 7? Let's check it on the value scale. I'm just going to do this quickly. It's too dark. Need a bit more white. When I say quickly, I mean I'm not going to do it really perfectly exactly. I, I've come to the conclusion after about 10, 15 years of working with Munsell that you can get a little bit too obsessed with the accuracy if you're not careful. And um, there are other parts of painting that are equal or more important. And I think that as long as you're close, you can learn a lot. And you, there's a lot that you can do by eye with experience. So <clears throat> it is a tool and I think it's a very useful tool. But I also think that it's, it is true that you can become too dependent on a tool. And the reason that I think that that can be a bad thing is because I think you can lose flexibility if you're not careful. If you always have to do things the same way. I don't think it's about losing feeling or anything like that or emotion. You can certainly, you can still get that in. The tool doesn't take that away. But I think you can get to a point where you miss some things. You're not thinking about some things because you're so focused on the accuracy in the tool. So that's a value seven, right? This is a value seven neutral. So this is no chroma at all. This is the highest chroma I can get from Quinacridone Rose, but it's too blue. Okay, I want it to be a little bit more towards red. It doesn't have to be very intense, but I will actually use a little bit of this permanent orange, right? Now that is actually, if I check it on my value scale, it's much, much darker, right? It's actually about five. So value five. So if I mix these two together, if I mix that into that, the value is going to drop. So I'm going to bring the value up of this to a seven as well. Getting dangerously close to my shadow color here. I'm going to run out of space. <laughs> Let's spoil all my carefully worked out colors. Carefully mixed. All right, so that's up to the same value about a value seven. So I've got a purple blue of a value seven and a kind of an orange red of a value seven. So if I mix a little bit between them, I get some of my purple blue and I bring in a little bit of my orange red. Let's get that out of the way. I end up with something in between the two, which is funny enough is what I want. But <clears throat> the chroma is like the maximum chroma I can get at that value, right? Which might be what I want. Sometimes that is what I want, the highest chroma that I can get at that value for that hue. But sometimes I want the chroma to be less. So as long as they're the same value, depends a little bit on the hue as well. But if I take some of this color and I mix in some of the neutral, then the value doesn't change too much. Sometimes you have to adjust because this is paint. It's not an abstract thing. And it would be lovely if this worked perfectly every time, but it actually doesn't. People do say that neutrals will bring down chroma perfectly in a straight line. Oh, uh, well, it's not true. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, and you've got to be aware of it. But generally speaking, the value won't change much. The hue won't change too much, but the chroma does drop. So this is like in between of these, right? Now, <clears throat> I was thinking about this the other day, actually. I was thinking, why don't... Everybody does value scales, or if you don't do value scales, you know you should, at the very least, right? Because they're very useful. Why don't people ever paint chroma scales in the same way that they do value scales? Because if you have a value scale like this, which again, you would need to do the workshop, you can actually mix a very accurate chroma scale of your own. 
making sure that the values stay the same. And the key is making sure that the value of this color and the value of this color are the same. So I've now got here one, two, three, four, five steps of chroma, changing very gradually from no chroma at all, from a neutral to a fairly high chroma color. All right. And then when I come back to the painting, that's how I can control the chroma shift here. So the value goes down, but the chroma goes down too. Now there's an extra little bit going on here because there's a frayed edge of that petal. And at that point, the chroma and the value and the hue change a little bit. They go a little bit more red. So I will have these colors mixed ready, but it's not like they're the only colors I'm going to use. They're, they they keep me from making any really big mistakes, but there's actually a high chrome, a very dark fringe on the edge of this petal that goes a little bit more orange. You know, and that helps me pretty much nail those colors there. Let me catch up with the comments. I get a bit distracted when I'm <laughs> talking about color. I could talk about that stuff all day. Hello, Diane, good to see you. Yeah, that phone trick is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant for, um, for checking value. Listen, I'm gonna drop a, give me, just give me a second. I'm gonna drop a link in for where you can get that value scale. It's only $10, I'm, it's absolutely brilliant. I'm just bringing it up on eBay. And of course, um, it's taken me to the UK eBay, which I don't want. Sometimes geolocation is very annoying. All right, let me just take all of the rubbish off the URL. God, they have long URLs, eBay. Right, here we go. I'm going to drop it in the comments. This is a link to, it's, this is nothing to do with me, by the way. This is put out by um, a guy called Paul Cantore. Um, and it costs $10. You can get it off eBay. He'll send you a little sticky note saying, thanks for buying my value scale. He's a lovely man. And it's simply the most useful. It's just the most useful thing in the world. <laughs> Let me try and catch up. Thank you, B. God, you're here at 12.35 a.m. Wow, Australia. I'm impressed. <laughs> Tinks, hello. <laughs> Tink says, I think it's amazing that you can talk so lucidly while painting. Um, honestly, it's only because I've been doing this for a long time. I've just got used to um, externalizing my thought process. And sometimes it gets me into trouble. <laughs> I just end up uh, driveling on about something endlessly that's particularly fascinated me. Um, but yeah, I used to find it uh, terribly hard and I still do sometimes. I mean, this is a demo really in which a lot of the stuff is already worked out beforehand. But, you know, I was working on portrait stuff recently and uh, I just zoned out. I realized I'd zoned out for about 20 minutes without saying anything. It does happen. Depends what I'm doing. So there you go, Kathy. There, that is where you can get that value scale. Now, eBay. David, good to see you. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm glad you're working on that. Letitia, hello. Good to see you. Yeah, that value scale, I don't think you ever could get it on Amazon, but you can get it. You can always get it on eBay. Um, 
on YouTube, you, if you go to my, my, oh, I've cut myself. Have I cut myself? Oh, yeah, pretty badly. Um, my palette knife, my palette knives, right, they get so much use on, on a ground glass palette that they become like knives after a while. I should really change this and get another one, and I've just gashed my little, <laughs> gashed my index finger with my palette knife. Anyway, let's get back to it. Valérie. Um, unfortunately, um, my French is not up to understanding what you've written, I'm afraid. I think you're saying that you are having trouble understanding the English and I have trouble understanding the French, so the best I can do for you is je ne comprends pas aussi. <clears throat> and that was probably wrong anyway. <laughs> Oh, Tom, that's handy. If he's that close to you, go and get one of his um, Munsell colour books as well. Valérie, no, je suis désolé. Hello, Susan. It's good to see you. Thank you so much. What a lovely thing to say. Everyone to check out, you probably, everybody here already knows Susan's work, but I want you to check out Susan Lyons. Incredible work, especially those portraits that you've been doing in pastel. Oh, my word. Knock me for six every time I see one. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting really distracted now. I think I want to see some background in this. Who wants to see some background? We've got to see some background now, right? Because um, <clears throat> I want to see how these red and pinks are working. And it's, it's basically, it's almost neutral. It's really low chroma blue. So, you know, I could, I mean, I think you have a lot of choices over your background. You don't, you know, just because there's a photo there doesn't mean you have to go with exactly what's there. Um, but to me, if I went in, because these colors are so delicate, if I went in with a very powerful background, it, by powerful, I mean a very high chroma intense background. This is an aesthetic choice, and I, I do absolutely get that. But to me, it would overwhelm it a little bit. It would just overwhelm it a little bit. You know, so I, I would rather... Um, I need to go a little bit lighter in here. I would rather... Um, Keep it very low chroma. So what? let's say what would happen if I went in. It wants to be like slightly lighter than this color here. So this is about the right value, probably. Let's get something a bit more interesting up that's got some texture to it. A hog. Hog, hog. Let's get a bigger one. Big hog. Big rough hog. That's just black. That's actually just black, ivory black and, and, and lead white. I kind of like that though. I mean, it's very, very low chroma, but because ivory black is basically a blue, it immediately starts, it changes the, the way that all of those carefully mixed orangey reds look. It changes them so much. You know, they look entirely different now. I'm just going to... Um, I'm starting to get interested now. Oh, I've just gashed myself again. I've got to learn to put my palette knife down. Everybody remind me, I need a new palette knife. That one's too sharp. I'm just going to soften some of these things because there comes a point, I think, with every painting where you start to think, oh, uh, you know what, this might work. And at that point, I start getting interested and I... I just want to soften some of those transitions to try and get a little bit more life into it. Um, I think probably just the black and the, for me anyway, for the, the black and the, um, the black and white, because it, it looks so blue, I think that would probably, that would probably be all right for me. But I want to see, I need, actually let's go really blue, titanium white and ivory black going to be even cooler, even more blue. Bring those, um, 
beautiful, subtle, like even the really low chroma reds are going to sing out against that. Now it's easier to see how they're all working. So I was saying earlier on about, you know, go through all this color, careful color mixing and everything. But at the end of the day, you've still got to use your eyes and you've got to use your own. Look at that. Gashed myself. <laughs> you've got to use your own. Um, I mean, this is where the experience comes in with painting, really. See, I think I definitely want more chroma here. And I want it to be lighter here. So I'm going to go. I don't want to use the titanium, though. Let's not be lazy. Because that will drop the chroma. So you know how people talk about chalkiness a lot? People talk about chalkiness, especially in the high values. A chalkiness of, of titanium white. It's basically... Um, it's because titanium white is... It, it's quite a, a powerful tinter. And it's also quite bluish. So if you've got orange colours and you go right up the top of the value scale with titanium white, you will tend to lose chroma. You'll lose quite a lot of chroma. I just feel like I can really punch this chroma in those shadow areas quite a bit higher. And it will look really nice. Ooh, I know the colour isn't that high chroma, all right? I know it isn't, and it's also not that dark, but I think it looks really nice there. <laughs> So I'm going to put it in anyway. And then further up, it actually gets lighter. So I wonder, so this is where it becomes difficult to get the chroma and the value at the same time. So I'm using the permanent orange. I'm sacrificing the hue, although it should be more blue red there in order to get me a little bit more chroma. And some, when it gets up here, it's almost white. So I can't keep the chroma there. I've got to lose it. Hmm. Have I explained enough about the colours? Hopefully I've explained enough about why they're there and, you know, what they all are. So this is basically what I'm talking about when I talk about colour stories. So the story of this rose is that the local colours go from the orange, more orange-reds on the inside of the rose, to the more, these kind of... Um, very blue reds, lower chroma blue reds on the outside of the rose. And then the colour story becomes how each of those locals changes from light to shadow. So you can see I'm gradually working across my palette. So now I've got the blue reds over here and I've got the more orange reds over here. And now I'm working on the areas between, which is when the things kind of start to come together really. And uh, the kind of the different sort of ch chapters, if you like, of this rose are starting to be linked together. I don't want to. I don't want to um, labour this analogy too much, but I just think it's a it's a helpful way to think about the colours in terms of um, a story because they actually go on a journey from light to shadow, and they go a, on a journey across the flower, and then every now and again they'll they'll take a little side road where something changes, like out here where it goes suddenly orange right on the edge of this a little bit more orange and darker on the edge of that petal petal that's a local color change it's not to do with the light there's not a change of the light there and out here just at the edge of the petals they turn away from the light so the value drops and the chroma drops and i think it's more important getting these color relationships right and having them work than it is trying to paint everything like really, really finished and really, really detailed. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with painting that way. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> but I am saying that that alone isn't going to fix your painting if your colors are wrong, if your values are out and your chroma is out. And your, if you like a way you could 
possibly think about it is if, you're, if you haven't translated the color story effectively. then you will hit some problems. You don't, I, I don't want to give the impression that I believe you must always paint with accurate color either. I think that's also a choice. It's an aesthetic choice. Um, me personally, I, I tend towards, I do tend towards um, as you probably all know, if you've seen me stream before, I, I do tend towards using fairly accurate color most of the time. Um, I'm, f I'm fascinated by the, the color things that are, but I'm also find, I also find that just lately, I'm increasingly playing a little. Not so much today, not so much with this one. Because this is a demo piece and I'm trying to show some things about the way color works, but <clears throat> from light to shadow, you know? I think once you have either an intuitive or, or a, a, an analytical understanding of the properties of color and how it generally changes from light to shadow, you know, it can only help your painting. Knowledge is always a good thing. It, it will never restrict your expression. It will only help it. That's my belief. And you know, I'm right, <laughs> obviously, I think I'm right. <laughs> the problem is so does everybody else, even when we don't agree. I'm enjoying this now. I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm not actually painting any petals. I'm thinking about the way the color is changing, which part of the rows I'm in and how the color is changing from light to shadow there. I'm also treating the edges a bit now. I'm, I'm going into a bit of edge handling to try and get that working nicely too. But I'm mostly just putting down color notes still. Working into the inside of the row, so I want over here like my red my more reddish, orangish red for the highlights. Sorry, I will catch up with the with the comments in a minute. I'm just uh, <clears throat> oh, that was a bit too much, too heavy-handed. I'm flying along a little bit now because I'm just painting. I'm just enjoying it. I must admit. I want to see some of the green in there. I really want to see some green. I'll, I'll, I'll just soften some of this a little bit. There's areas I haven't got to yet. And then I'll check the comments and then I'm going to pop in and um, I'm going to put the leaves. I'll show you actually how I mix colors for leaves. Ivory black and titanium white in my background. What do you think of the background? Do you think it's all right or do you think it's too grey? Give me your personal opinion. It doesn't mean I'm going to change it. <laughs> in fact, I definitely won't because I like it how it is. But also you can see like it's broken this so you can see some of the, the warmer colours from the underpainting coming through as well and it gives it like a little bit of texture, you know, which I think is nice. I like that texture there. What did I say I was going to do? Oh, check the comments. There is a danger with streaming live too much where you get to a point where sometimes you forget that you are live. <clears throat> and um, you, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe, I may zone out for a little bit if I'm not careful and just paint. I will try not to though. Paul, put the brush down, put the brush down. Okay. Let me catch up. Oh, it's been very busy in the comments and I'm not keeping up at all. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll try and catch up with everything now if I can. I'll probably miss some. I'm sorry. Yeah, that value scale is ten dollars. I mean, it's just it's just so useful. Just just get one. It's great. Ten dollars, you know, a couple of cups of coffee. Yeah, Logan, if you missed the phone thing, don't forget this gets recorded on YouTube, so you can always watch it again. <clears throat> Diane says, I see you were using AB Angles brush, Rosemary's Angled Eclipse. It's the Angled Eclipse. I've got, um, I've got, uh, I've got two or three, maybe a few more half inch, which I use mostly, and then a few quarter inch as well. And I find that's plenty for most things, you know, for something like this, Just a single rose painting like this, that's plenty. And, um, just don't buy the hogs. They're, they're just so awful. The natural bristle brushes I've had from Rosemary's have been awful, but the synthetics are nice, really nice, I think. Rick of Denmark, welcome. Very nice to see you. And hello, Kathy from Dayton. Oh, Susan, really good to see you're here. Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say, Susan. I hope you're all right. We are. Um, this is kind of, I'm just demoing at the moment, really. I'm trying to talk a little bit about the color choices and why they are the way they are. I'm, I'm fiddling a little bit with edges as well. I mean, this is, I must admit, I do like this part of painting. See, I want to make a hard edge and then destroy it. because some of the hardness will stay. So if I get that edge harder there and then just go across it a little bit, soften it out a little. This is another thing about um, painting into a, a layer of oil like this is, you can really pull the paint around once it's, after, once it's on the panel, you can really pull it around really easily and it uh, works really nicely. You know, to get really gentle, soft blends, it works really well for painting these kind of subjects where you're basically... There's, there's very few hard edges, really. Most of them are fairly soft. And you can put on more paint or less as, as you wish and then blend it and you can get some really kind of subtle effects this way. I heart painting into a couch. I absolutely heart it. What do you think? I think she's coming. Bit by bit, I think our little rose is beginning to appear. It's a kind of a lower chroma, less intense area there. I, I, ma I massively overdid the chroma in this bit here. Now that I'm, more of it is filling in, I think I might have got a bit overexcited there and maybe I'll have to pull it back. <clears throat> I think I might have overdid and I, I overdid the value there and the chroma as well, I think. Come on, be sensible, Paul. I've got a bit carried away, haven't I? Let's let's be honest. This shouldn't be this high chroma. It's not right in the middle of the rows. It shouldn't be as dark or as high chroma as that bit there. I mean, I like it and everything. It's a nice colour, but it's the wrong it's the wrong colour in the wrong place. It doesn't go there, so I'm going to pull it back a little. Got excited and overdid it.
a lot of painting. I mean, it's I, I think anyway for me, it's it's a, it's a slow kind of meditative process. And I often find because I'm splitting my time when I'm live, I sometimes I end up doing things. I get excited and do something that I probably should have been a little bit more careful about. Susan, yes, the recording will be available. Um, you basically, if you just go to my um, YouTube channel and it'll be on there. If you go, I think you can go into light, there's a, on the, Once you get into the channel, I think you can go in there's a, a menu where you can go into live stuff. And I, as far as I'm aware, pretty much every live stream I've ever done is in there. I think. Green. Oh, I'm still catching up on comments. I want to do the leaves a little bit. I think it's really going to lift it. This is an interesting question from NASA. Can you talk a bit about when to use lead white versus titanium white? The, it basically comes down to the properties of the paint. So le lead white is, um, I, I like the handling quality more. Um, by which I mean I, I like the way it goes down onto the panel. It tends to be more kind of word people use usually is, is ropey or, or or stringy. You could say um, it slides about a lot more than titanium white. Titanium white tends to just go down there and stay where you put it. So there's the handling qualities. That's one difference. Um, Titanium white is a higher value than lead white. So if you need to get right up the top of the value range, as high as you can possibly get, then uh, titanium will get you there. Uh, titanium is slightly bluer. So if you're mixing a high value blue and you want to keep as much chroma as, in there as you possibly can, titanium is a good choice. Um, lead white is slightly more orange so if you're trying to mix a very high chrome a very high value a high value and um, orange or yellow and you are right at the top of the value range then lead white will work better but i think a lot of it for me is i there's there's just something about the consistency of lead white that that has worked its way into the way i uh, move paints around and I, I find that I can't quite get the brush strokes that I like as much with, um, with titanium. But I only use titanium if I need the very highest values or if I want a high value blue and I, I don't want to lose chroma. Does that, answer, does that answer your question? Mostly I use lead white. Like say I was painting some roses in a vase and um, the highlight and, and, it, and it was, they were sitting in daylight on a sunny day. So the light in the studio was reflected off blue sky. Then I would tend for the, for the highlight on the vase, I would tend to use titanium white because it's slightly blue it's going to be higher value than anything else in the painting if I want that highlight to stand out that is so that would be a pretty good choice hello Brenda good to see you Ina says, if I'm painting on a five by seven canvas, what size angle eclipse brush would you suggest? The same, to be honest with you, I would get um, two or three of these, the half inch ones, and then two or three of the, of the small quarter inch ones. 
you know, because you want to be able to create a range of strokes. Well, I think it would help you. Hmm, most people are liking the background so far. It does look bluish. It's actually, I mean, it is bluish, but, you know. Sorry, Laurie, I missed you leaving. Hello, Stephanie. Banjo is actually not here at the moment, Susan. He's um, he's really going downhill a bit late, lately. He's all right. He's still happy. And we had a nice little session today where I groomed him and he was quite happy about that. But he, he is really sleeping a lot at the moment and he's starting to find it difficult to get about. Um, but he's still happy. He's eating well. And he did actually catch a mouse in the kitchen the other day. <laughs> He didn't know what to do with it once he caught it, but he did catch one. But he's okay. My old man, he's doing all right. For anyone who doesn't know, Banjo is my cat. So I think um, I'm just looking at that background and I'm thinking, bring the value down. Just a little bit. Because I think if the value came down a little bit in the background, I think um, the highlights on the rows would come out a little more. I mean, not very much, just a little bit. Yeah, you see, I mean, people would will say, and in some instances, to be fair, they may be right, or, you know, where it's right for them, that people will say that, that <clears throat> value is, you know, this is the value of the shadow. It must be this value. That's what value it should be. And I'm, I'm personally, I think you have a, a bit of leeway over values. If you, you know, this is where it stops being just a, a copy of a photo and it becomes, a, you know, something a little bit different. If I bring the value of the background down a little, it makes overall, just by putting a bit more black in it, it, it brings the lights of the, of the rows out a little bit. The lights felt like they were getting a little bit swamped by the background. I feel like now they're standing out a bit more. So I'll bring it down a little bit lower than it really is. Not very much. I mean, you know, I'm not, not going mad with it or anything, just to help the light stand out a little. Oh, wow. That's an amazing thing to say. I, I actually, I, I, I'm not in that league at all, but thank you for saying it. I've seen some of his paintings and uh, just now. <laughs> but it's a very nice thing to say. I've gone a bit too dark over here, so I'm going to bring this up a little bit. Just I'm into like adjustment stage now. I'm actually thinking, I mean, part of the reason that I thought this would be a nice thing, subject for a workshop, roses like this is, um, right, drop the chroma. Come in out here. Is, uh, I'm actually thinking about painting just a series of single roses. I quite fancy doing them on a round panel, like I've got this one. I need to move this painting on, actually, before I forget about it. But this one I'm working on at the moment, which is a round painting. I want to do some more on that. But I'm also thinking about getting a bunch of smaller round panels and doing a series of single roses, you know. I definitely prefer the, the background just a, a little bit darker. Um, Michael Harding warm white is titanium white mixed with a little bit of orange paint. Just, I mean, don't, don't buy those warm whites. They're, they're, you know, that's paint manufacturers getting a little bit cheeky, to be honest with you. You can, you can make it. If you've got titanium white and you've got a bit of yellow ochre, that's it. You know, really, I get a bit annoyed when paint manufacturers do stuff like that. It's just titanium with a, with a tinted titanium. That's all it is. Good to see you too, Susan. He's, old Banjo is fine. He's still happy. He's just, um, he's getting on, you know. Green. 
I'm going to do some green mixing at the moment. I'll show you how I go about this actually, because I think this is something useful to show. Uh, palette. Don't have much room left on the palette, so I'm going to have to knock the reference photo out for a second. Zinc white, I, I personally don't touch because um, I've heard enough about it being brittle that I'd rather not mess with it. <coughs> Flake white is just lead white. Same thing, different name. I want to mix a green. I'll show you how people who've been on my workshops, this can be boring for you because you would have seen me do this a hundred times. So um, there's a couple of different ways that I approach this, a couple of different yellows I can use. These are green yellows. So I've got an orange yellow here, which is cad red, cad yellow, <laughs> sorry. This is cadmium yellow lemon, which is pretty good for this, you know, it, it works, but the chroma is a little bit low. The nice thing about cadmium yellow lemon is it has a little bit more body. This is bright yellow lake. It's an arylide yellow from Michael Harding. Um, it is PY3. Diarylide, ground in linseed. And it's higher chroma, but it's slightly trickier because it's very transparent. So it depends, like very transparent. And it takes an age to dry. So it depends what you mix it with. But this, it works quite well. Now, this is Windsor & Newton, Windsor Green Yellow Shade. It's just a thallo green. Any thallo green will do for this. Because we just want to pull the mix about. So I'm going to use three colours to start with. I'm going to get some black. I'm going to... Actually, let's do a test. On the one on the left, I'm going to mix it with the cad lemon yellow, cad yellow lemon, whatever they call it. And you'll see that I end up with a kind of a yellow, a dark yellow green. Okay. I don't know. I mean, obviously it depends on how good your screen is, if you're going to be able to see any difference here. I'll do the other one with the arylide yellow. It's much weaker in the mix. So I'm going to have to put more in to get to the same value. But it's also, the green comes out higher chroma, significantly higher chroma, and slightly more towards blue. And actually, this green is um, pretty much bang on for rose petals. Um, no, rose leaves obviously they vary a bit so if it happens to be a leaf that goes a bit more towards a blue green like this one you can get a little bit of thallow and mix that in as well it will raise the chroma and it will send it towards blue green at low values because rose leaves are usually very low value this these colors here will get you pretty much the highest chroma you can get right down the value scale and if you need to go down into the shadow the only way you can go from there is to come down into black because um, that's already very dark now to black Nice. Let's put a bit of that on there and see how it looks. I'm going to get a fresh brush. I'm going to use another angled eclipse. I use these a lot for flowers, you know, angled eclipses. I usually get a bit of medium on it first and then... Where's the darkest bit? The nice dark area here. Ooh, now we're going right down the value scale and we're putting some green in. See, I really like this little bit of leaf here. I like it because it's, it's an opportunity to have a very low value against a very high value with a sharp edge. Very nice. And it changes the feeling of everything else.
I'm mostly interested in seeing these dark greens against these uh, against the pinks. I'm not all that fussed about them being perfect leaves, to be honest with you. And where it goes into the light, it basically the chroma really drops. The value comes up, but the chroma really drops because that's they're very shiny these leaves. So <clears throat> the neutral higher value will give me pretty much what I need for the lighter part of the leaf. Very nice. Well, that changed things. Quite a bit. It's almost like, I, <laughs> this is going to sound really silly, but it's almost like roses were designed this way for these beautiful dark green leaves just to set off the, the colours of the roses. I want to go a little bit more orange in here. Oh, let me put the photo back up. I knew I was going to forget to do that. This is the danger with changing things over a lot. No, we don't want that. What do we want? That and that. There we go. So this being a demo, I've actually come and talking about the color, you know, and what's happening to the color and, and going for color accuracy, mostly today with this. I feel I've come quite close to the photo, probably closer than I'm, I'm really comfortable being. I kind of feel like I want to bring some uh, something else to the, to the story. I, I want to, uh, I want to give my take on the story, like how I feel about this color story, what I think is more beautiful and also more, I would like to bring more expression to the brush strokes. So if, if I was painting this, um, just as a painting that I wanted to do as a finished painting, I would probably paint slightly differently. But I wanted to explain some stuff about the colour today. And hopefully I, I have gone some way towards demystifying a little bit the colours of this rose. And I haven't really painted, I've kind of painted the petals, but what I've mostly done is put down colour notes and tried to make sure that they were pretty accurate. And tried to keep this sort of flow from um, the oranges in the middle to the purple. More, more blue reds on the outside and also this where the chroma drops right off into the shadow. This is probably my favourite part of this subject, is this area here, where it goes off into that really lovely, subtle, almost a grey. Well, I think I'm going to wrap it up for today. I'm starting to feel a little tired. How long have I been on? No. An hour and a half. It doesn't feel like an hour and a half. Let me catch up with the comments.
Thank you, Linda. What a lovely thing to say. Hello, Eduardo. Good to see you. Ina says, what light colour besides cad yellow and cad lemon did you use on the leaf colour? I brought a little bit of a neutral in because when it goes up into, um, into the light parts of the leaf, because these leaves are shiny, what happens is you lose a lot of chroma. The chroma drops right off, you know, so like the shiny bits like this bit here, it goes almost grey. They're usually not quite as light as you think, but it goes almost grey there. Because, because the, the surface of the leaf is shiny, what's happening is the light is being reflected pretty much straight back to your eye. So there's very little colour in it. There's very little hue in it. It's almost entirely um, just the colour of the light. which in this case is very neutral because this was this the photo that I'm working from was taken in um, in natural daylight so even when I work from photos I take my reference photos in in daylight so even if you can't have a permanent setup you know at least you know, you can take the photos that you work from in daylight, so you get really good light on, on the photos, you know, and it will help. It will help. Or, um, paintings because your reference will be so much nicer. All right, I'm fiddling a little bit, I know fiddling a bit <laughs> it's allowed it's allowed at the end okay thank you very much everybody i hope you enjoyed it well, before i sign off though i'm going to drop in i've been talking about this workshop and it's connected to what i've been painting today like going through the colors of this rose let me drop a link if you want to find out more about it you can do so here and because you were all so lovely and came along, you will also get a very generous discount if you sign on through that link. Um, but the discount expires on Saturday and we start on the 4th of April. And we're basically going to do a load of these single roses of different colours. Look at this one. Where am I? Now that's a tricky rose to paint. Look how close the values are and the chroma is so high, really low down. We're going to do probably this very rose. But I've also got... I'm looking at these as they're slowly opening. Now this is... It's not a peony. It is a rose, but it looks like a peony. And how gorgeous is that? And that is pretty much blue red. It's the opposite of the one that I've just painted. So it's blue red all the way through, especially in the middle. And when you get to the outside, the chroma drops way down, but it also goes slightly orange. So it's almost like the opposite way around. Similar colors, but the opposite way around to this rose. Yum. I think I could happily spend the rest of my life painting roses and not mind. Anyway, thank you very, very much, everybody. Um, yeah, I'll see you in the workshop, Jill. I'm really glad you're going to be coming. Um, time for me to sign off. Uh, last time I was live, my, my stomach started grumbling and it was coming across on the mic and I can feel it's just about to start. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do the sensible thing and sign off before it starts grumbling again. Um, but thanks. It was lovely to paint with you. Um, and I'll see you all again soon.